Hey there, welcome to episode 86 of the Social Business Engine podcast. This is the podcast where I invite thought leaders from all industries who are excited to share with you, the modern business executive, how to use social media in your business strategy. I'm Bernie Borges, CEO of Find and Convert and your host of the Social Business Engine podcast. Now, I recorded this episode on location at Dell World 2015 in Austin, Texas. I was honored to be invited to attend Dell World as a member of their influencer community, which in Dell's eyes is equal to being a member of the press. In fact, my badge said press on it. So as such, I attended a private press conference that was delivered by Michael Dell on the evening before the main event. And a special highlight for me was when Michael Dell was mingling with the press crowd after the press conference, and I got a chance to take a picture with him. That was really cool. I will post that picture in the show notes, so be sure to check that out. Now, I have a huge respect for Michael Dell. He founded Dell 32 years ago in the infancy years of the PC industry. So he is truly a pioneer in the tech industry. I don't know if you know, but today Dell is a 110,000 employee company. Yes, 110,000 employees. And in case you missed it, Dell just announced recently a deal to acquire EMC, which is a 50,000 employee company that specializes in storage devices. It is the biggest deal in tech history. And it's going to greatly expand Dell's footprint in in the enterprise with a broader offering of computing infrastructure that ranges from PCs, we've all had a Dell PC at some point in our life, maybe you still do, to servers, to storage devices, and many, many, many other IT-centric solutions. Now, the reason that I was invited to attend Dell World as an influencer is because they had an area on the main conference floor... It's called The Social Garden, where they live-streamed interviews with industry thought leaders. And I was on a panel that was moderated by Charlene Lee, CEO of Altimeter Group, where we discussed social selling. And I'll provide a link to that also in the show notes. Now, after that panel session, I had a chance to spend some time talking with Charlene Lee, and she agreed to be a guest on a future podcast episode of the Social Business Engine. And that is going to be time with the release of new research that she is working on. I'm really excited about that, and I want you to stay tuned for that. Now, as I mentioned, I recorded this episode at Dell World, where I had the pleasure of meeting Ari Lightman. Ari is a professor and director at Carnegie Mellon University, where he teaches classes on IT transformation, marketing, social media, and mobile content. So I asked Ari to explain his journey from private industry, where he was involved in several startups as well as management consulting, to becoming an educator at the distinguished Carnegie Mellon University, also known as CMU. In particular, I asked Ari to share a few stories of the research that his grad students, his graduate students, conduct for brands and how these brands really learn valuable insights from Ari's grad students at CMU. Now, this episode is sponsored by Dell, a global leader in technology, as well as a leader among enterprises in the use of social media to add value by listening to customers, building relationships, and deepening those relationships. We have published a social business journal issue with Dell that's titled Digital Transformation, Social Selling Research Insights and Best Practices. Now, this research was created in partnership with Ari Lightman's team at Carnegie Mellon University's Heinz College. The journal provides an up-to-date snapshot of social selling in large IT organizations. In fact, in addition to leading the research for this journal, Ari Lightman is also a key contributor to the journal. Now, the journal is available for ungated download at our website at socialbusinessengine.com slash journals, which is our journals page. And yes, you heard right, it's ungated. So no form to fill out, 
just click on the report and you can open it in your browser and of course download it from there. And if you're mobile right now and you're hearing this, of course you know that our website is mobile friendly. Now, if you're subscribed by email to get our weekly podcast updates, which we send every Friday, then you've already been notified about this journal. It's somewhere in your inbox. And if you're not subscribed to our weekly updates by email, and you want to subscribe, and I hope you do, just visit our subscribe page at sociobusinessengine.com. And now here's my interview with Ari Lightman from Carnegie Mellon University's Heinz College, which I recorded live on location at Dell World. So please pardon the background noise from the event. Enjoy. Oh, hi, Bernie. Thanks for having me. Um, my name is Ari Lightman. I'm a professor at Carnegie Mellon University. Uh, specifically at the Heinz College. Uh, I teach courses in digital media and marketing. I also run a center, uh, Executive Education Certificate Center, for Chief Information Security Officers. Wow, that's quite a bit. Now, Ari, you were telling me that you were not always a college professor, that you have a background in management consulting. So maybe before we get into some of the really interesting things that you're doing in the classroom... Why don't you talk about kind of the path, the journey that got you from private industry, management consulting to the classroom in a college graduate location? Um, wow. wow. So uh, going <laughs> way back, Bernie, um, uh, once I uh, did my MBA, I was very interested in how startups create value. Um, I was very interested in sort of the agile development methodology. Um, and I just wanted to experience that culture. So did four startups, one in the Bay Area during the bubble, um, or before the bubble in 99 during the hype cycle. Mm. Um, I did another in Philadelphia, uh, very early stage. Um, the one in California was around uh, web development. These were around telecommunications management. Um, and I did another in, in Pittsburgh, where I am now, and a fourth where I was the VP of sales for a robotics company. I was actually oh, selling wow. uh, huge half-million-dollar robots into the municipal sector. I uh, was very interested in the flip side, how organizations transform, how they think about change, how they restructure around organizational norms and behavior patterns. So <clears throat> I, um, I became a management consultant. And um, it was really interesting. Uh, my background, uh, since I did some inv investment, was looking at telecommunications, robotics, sensor technologies, as well as social technologies. Um, I kind of had got this hat, the social media guy. Maybe huh. I was the only one who had a Facebook page at the time. <laughs> um, but I started uh, talking to a variety of different companies about what they're doing around social media. Um, what's their presence on it? Um, how are they staffing it and creating value out of it? But I kept getting the same question over and over again. What is the ROI of a Facebook fan? Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> like, I don't know, but we could probably do some really cool analytics around it because any social media effort and campaign generates a tremendous amount of data. Even back then, this was back in 2006, 2007. Um, so I found myself in Wall Street in 2008, which was a very interesting time to oh, be yeah. in Wall great, Street. Great time to be in Wall Street. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Lots of fun. Uh, working for a financial services provider and helping them sort of analyze um, al what they called alternative research, which is really looking at all the unstructured data that gets generated through social campaigns um, and basically try to find elements that they could utilize to translate into business value. Um, very, very difficult to do. Uh, we didn't have a lot of the analytical horsepower that we have now. Um, but uh, this was a tremendous potential uh, for a lot of different folks. So what I did was um, <laughs> on, on, on my home front, my wife started traveling internationally and we have two kids. So uh, we have no family in Pittsburgh. They're not autonomous units yet. Um, I'm hoping they'll be autonomous soon. I'd like to put some uh, Your kids, uh, implants in them. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Um, so I needed, to, I needed to get stop traveling so much. So my wife was traveling internationally. I needed to be back home uh, with two school-age kids. And um, I became, uh, uh, you know, my own consultant, if you will. Um, I had a few clients. 
But I had this really interesting idea for a class that I had ever since I did my MBA program where I, I really was thinking about experiential and project-based learning, primarily because I remember hiring students who are not ready to be in front of clients. Hmm. Um, and I when, to, when you were a management consultant. Yeah. Okay. I, I wanted to give them that experience while yeah. they're in the university setting. Right. So I created this really weird class. I called it experiential learning. Um, a lot of folks call it action-based learning, uh, design thinking. And I invited seven companies that I knew of to come into CMU, give a challenge problem to the students, and have them solve it over the course of the semester. Hmm. So that one class turned into another class that turned into another class. Hmm. And... Uh, about 18 months later, I went from an adjunct to a full-time professor. Well, that's outstanding. So I don't meet too many people that have had that career path, Ari, that have gone <laughs> from private industry, especially in a management consultant role, and then yeah. you know, transitioning over into the, the classroom. And th these are graduate students that you're teaching? Yep. Okay. So um, I want to spend some time talking about some examples, because we were talking offline before this recording about some work that you're doing, projects that you're doing for some brands. Yeah. So I jotted a few down. Why don't we start with, uh, there's a certain baseball team in your city that you did something for. <laughs> yeah. So we've had um, uh, a great relationship with uh, the Pirates. The That's Pittsburgh the Pittsburgh Pirates, Pirates That's for, for those that may not know uh, baseball. Right. Right. Uh, affectionately called the Buckos. Uh, the Pirates came to us with an interesting problem. Not a problem, but um, something that they wanted um, uh, some more clarity around, which was how do people, um, what are the different communities associated with engagement um, around uh, ticket purchases? So they have a lot of information on the folks who are, um, you know, frequent ticket buyers, right? Uh, the people hold seasons passes and those sorts of things. Um, but it's the other community, the people that go casually to a baseball game that they wanted to get some more clarity around what drives them to a ball game, right? Is it a family outing? Is there some sort of incentive? Those sorts of things. Um, how do they acquire tickets? Uh, what do they respond to online? Do they engage with the brand, the pirates? Do they engage with the players? Those sorts of things. So we did a whole bunch of analysis for them, which was really interesting. Um, find out that people uh, do respond uh, very, um, very well with some of the different players. And we also figured out a little bit about the customer journey associated with how they identify where tickets are available. Um, but we also did some previous research on attribute analysis. Um, say you were going to go to a baseball game and what might drive you to the ball game? Mm -hmm. Is it um, how the team's playing that season? Is it the opposing team that they might be playing? Mm -hmm. Is it the giveaway that mm -hmm. they're providing? Is mm -hmm. it a t time of the day right. or time of the day week? Day of the week, yeah. Those sorts of things right. all have attributes associated with why specific people might right. make that purchase. So the team did a fantastic job. Um, in the end, I sort of challenged them to come up with some sort of uh, algorithm so they came up with a P. The team meaning your research team. Yeah, yeah this okay. team of students. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so uh, they came up with a P I R A T E algorithm, and I forgot what the, P the acronym stands really? for, okay. but it's a pirate algorithm. And um, uh, basically, the idea was plugging in some of the data that they're collecting associated with. Um, what the witnessing online keywords and sentiment mapping and those sorts of con community analysis um, in order to optimize sales. So the team boasted that you know they could save or uh, generate an additional million or two in revenue. Um, but really, the idea is to put an algorithm in front of the organization that they could take a look at and say, yeah, I, th I think you're on the right track associated with this, or we need to tweak this variable, or we have to look at this coefficient. Those sorts of things, right? Okay. So what they might have spent X amount of dollars on with a management consulting company or an agency, they got through graduate students uh, through you at CMU. Yeah. I mean, a lot of times companies come to us with that very same notion, Bernie. They, they say, listen, we, don't, we have an interesting idea. It might not be on the critical path. Right, in which case we might have to have a management consultant come in and take a look at it. Um, but it's something we want to explore. 
we just don't want to shell out um, you know, large sums of money that we might if we engage a management consulting group. So they come to my students with a challenge question. Uh, ch- students look at it um, sort of, how should I say it, uh, with open eyes, right? Mm-hmm. They're not indoctrinated by any sort of uh, management consulting methodology right. or any sort of industry bias. They right. say, yeah, that sounds cool. Let's yeah, do, it's let's a problem to solve. It. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sounds okay, like a good time. Let's talk about a couple more here. Um, this little shoe company called Nike. Yeah, what'd you do for them? Um, so Nike came to us with an interesting um, idea around uh, March Madness, where they were creating some crafted apparel um, that matched specific schools logos in terms of color combinations those sorts of things um so let's say you're a big blue devils fan right and you're very active on social media by understanding um sort of uh all of the groundswell of uh information and the engagement um around the blue devils um, maybe specifically Krzyzewski or players or those sorts of things, um, they have a good inclination of purchase patterns, right? So they might create a shoe um, that matches the Blue Devils logo, right? Uh, what is it, silver and blue? Or is it white and blue? Um, so they were looking at um, if you're going across all of March Madness, all the various different teams that are going down into the brackets, which ones have the greatest level of engagement and would have the best potential associated with for Nike to create a custom shoe for that specific school. Hmm. So the funny thing is, Bernie, um, you know, at Carnegie Mellon, we have a lot of foreign students. Um, I had six Indian students who've never seen a basketball game. I was going to, I was actually going to say <laughs> for those listeners, not in the U S March madness is the college, um, playoffs, right. Really of college basketball playoffs. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, that's a great point. Yeah, so one of my students said, "Wow, this is this is a lot different than cricket." <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> "Yes, it is." <laughs> um, but they were uh, they were enthralled. They got a chance to watch a lot of the games um, and really get into the whole spirit around March Madness. But actually, do some really interesting analysis while the games were going on. Hmm. Were there any specific ahas? Any light bulbs? Yeah, I mean, so they identified different types of communities associated with how they respond to the games. And you could do some sentiment mapping, right? So you can see there are definitely communities uh, um, that issue a lot of positive sentiment towards the school. And there's obviously a lot of negative sentiment towards Mm -hmm. the school. And it really depends on how they're doing in the playoffs. And there was a lot of actually specific to particular players, right? So... Sometimes this has to be sort of weeded out as noise. So we had to create some um, Boolean search strings that looked at various different attributes associated with um, engagement factors um, and then create some experimental methodologies that would allow the company, Nike, to figure out which might be the best bet in terms of creating these customized um, brands, if you will, uh, for these different, uh, for these different uh, powerhouse So schools. what your team, your research team, that is, your students, yeah. what, what they did is they, they did the work, they compile all the findings, mm-hmm. and then do they actually present them to, in this case, Nike? Yeah. So, they do. So they're actually client-facing. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they have to be. Okay. So I tell clients that come in, I say, um, because they're all interested in what the resource load is. Um, and I tell each of them, listen, you get out of it what you put into it. But at a minimum, it's a call a week with the students to make sure that they're on the right track. They're getting the data that they need. Um, and they sort of understand the context around how the industry is operating. Um, but at the end, we get a representative from each company to come out. So we do seven projects at once during a semester. And there's a representative from each of the companies that comes out and listens to all the presentations. It's a full three hours. Wow. Yeah. That's a, that's a great experience for the students, the graduate students. Yeah. And, you know, I remember sort of the first time we ran the class, um, there was a, a gentleman at Thomson Reuters who came in for the final presentation. He listened to what the students had to say and said, you know what, this is really, this is really interesting stuff. You... you, you um, 
you caught on some very interesting elements here that we should know as an, as an organization. I can go back to New York and tell this to various different folks, or you could go back to New York. So he flew them all out to New York. These are all wow. graduate students. And they presented to the SVP of marketing and a variety of different project managers. I think they got about an hour and a half of sleep the night before. So <laughs> I was a little nervous, but they did a phenomenal job. And um, the SVP of marketing basically said, you know, that was fantastic. Which one of you folks needs a job? One of the students was going to Deloitte. The other was going to Cisco. And the third one raised his hand and said, I need a job. He's hired that day. No And he's kidding. still there. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Oh, did you? Yeah. That is, that's great news. I love that story. That's a great story. All right. So let's do a couple more here because we've got uh, the time for it. Um, there's a, a company, I guess, that you would say that they're in the auto industry, right? <laughs> that you did something for. Yeah. So um, Daimler had an interesting um, interesting project for us. We worked for the, um, there's an advanced technology group on Palo Alto that was really interested in um, sort of the connected driver um, and really looking at trying to understand how various different data gets captured, analyzed, what that tells you about specific driver patterns and how it could sort of drive communication and messaging to various different community groups, right? So, you know, let's say you're a bit of a lead foot and you like performance, right? My messaging to you will be a little bit different than if somebody's more of a, let's say, a tree hugger and is very interested in sort of, um, you know, fuel economy and those sorts <laughs> of things, right? So messaging meaning the messaging that's coming through on the... Corporate uh, marketing, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. And, and so um, was there any kind of a similar experience there where the, the students had a chance to present the findings and maybe some recommendations? Yeah, it's the same thing. So they presented to folks um, who came in um, from the advanced research group, mm -hmm. um, told them a little bit about their techniques associated with data capture and analysis. They developed actually an experimental framework that could be directly transferred to them. So they could start doing some analysis, start understanding everything from customer journey mapping to community analytics to sentiment around um, various different models, various different attributes associated with driver behaviors and patterns. Um, and, you know, they, they really enjoyed it. Awesome. So, all right, I want to take the conversation in a little bit different direction now. Sure. Um, you, you, you're teaching graduate students essentially how to understand the data associated with um, interaction and social, right? Mm -hmm. So what are these students' expectations when they go into the workforce as it relates to social technology? Do they, do they have expectations that, you know, they're going to be, they're going to have full license to use their mobile phones on social do they expect that the social technology is going to be inherent in everything that they use to, to get their jobs done to work? You know, what, what, what's their mindset? Oh, they expect everything, Bernie. Yeah, and um, I guess we don't do a good job getting them ready for reality at, uh, within school. <laughs> well, that's really why I wanted to have this, this part of the conversation. Because yeah. right? you're in the front lines you know, teaching. Right. And so that's an exception to who I'm typically talking to on this podcast, yeah, right? I'm yeah. typically t talking to people at brands. So maybe you can share some insights on what you're seeing from the students. Right. And then I'm sure over time you've seen those students transition from being a student to right. being in the workforce. Right. So let me take a step back and tell you about w what it's like at CMU. All right. So Carnegie Mellon University. Yeah. Okay. So Carnegie Mellon is, you know, one of the top technical universities um, in the world, and um, we're a default open environment, right? So students bring their own everything. Um, they hook them up to the network. So you can imagine what that day is like if you're an information security director, yeah, right? right? Um, orientation, you get uh, thousands of students from all over the world coming in and, and basically just connecting to the network, right? <laughs> wow. No idea what's on their devices at this point. Um, but we're a default open environment, um, so we have to pay attention to a lot of da data signals. Um, and um, 
Students have a list of software that they could utilize. There's probably well over 90 different applications. Um, we have classes on Python and Hadoop, uh, MapReduce, variety of different things. I have a, you know, in my class, which is measuring social, the, well, the default software package of record for a lot of higher education universities, institutions, Blackboard. Um, and Blackboard's great as a document repository and send out emails and those sort of, it's, I don't think it's the best tool for collaboration. So we have a Facebook page, hmm. right? Because that's what, I know they're always on Facebook because I could see the reflection in the glass in my classroom that they're on Facebook <laughs> during my lecture, right? <laughs> so if I want to communicate with them and have a discussion with them offline, I do it on Facebook or I do it on Twitter. Um, Although it's a FERPA violation, the Family Education Resource Prevention Act. <laughs> oh, is that right? Yeah. Huh. But, um, you know, I think, you know, the, the powers that be understand that it, it's challenging to connect with students. And we have to do it in whichever way, shape, form we can. Right. Um, so uh, and they use whatever they want for collaboration. They can they'll, they'll use, you know, Basecamp, Asana what have you, Google Drive, those sorts of things. So, And they're used to testing out these new technologies and trying it. We have three technologies that we use in my class. We, have, um, we use Comscore uh, for online utilization and measurement. Uh, we use um, Networked Insights, Kairos, for social intelligence and listening. We also mm -hmm. use BrandWatch for social listening. Mm -hmm. um, so when they go into the corporate world, they expect to utilize a lot of these tools and to have the same sort of freedoms that they have in university. So it becomes a bit of a shock to them when they're issued sort of the corporate sanctioned device or um, the IT department locks down a lot of specific functions on their phones and installs corporate sanctioned apps and those sorts of things. And they're, they're not allowed to utilize maybe their community. Um, so it's interesting. I went to... Um, uh, I did a talk at Interopt on BYOD. Mm -hmm. right, this was a while ago. Bring and your like, own device. Yeah. So I'm like, okay, no problem. I, I'll go and I can talk about anything. And then I went to Wikipedia <laughs> and looked up what BYOD means. Uh, bring your own device. I'm like, no, 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 you got it wrong. This is a band. This is just um, a stopgap. It's bring your own everything. That's what these students want. They want to bring everything that makes them um, sort of who they are. Mm. So... I'll, I'll tell you a little story. There's, there's a large financial services firm on Wall Street, hired a wide swath of students during one particular year, and within three years, they were all gone. Hmm. And the students left for, you know, maybe less um, lower-paying jobs, but jobs where they were allowed to utilize all the devices that made them effective, that hmm. optimized their learning experience while they were in the job, um, that allowed them sort of autonomy associated with um, project-based work. Um, so, so they work a little bit differently. They work with different tools differently. And when, and when companies try to create some structure and containment around them, um, it doesn't really work very well. Either they'll figure out a way around it or they'll just leave. So <clears throat> what I hear you saying then is that the open environment is really what the students expect. Um, what about, have you heard anything in terms of how they expect to work on a daily basis and in integrating any other kind of social technologies? So I'm, I'm, I'm thinking in terms of like collaboration tools that are very social, um, uh, integrating even into uh, employee advocacy, structured programs. What, what are you seeing there, again, in the tr that transition from student to workplace? So right now we're doing a study. Um, on uh, new forms of work modalities. Um, so telework, remote work. Right. Why do they call it telework? We're not telephoning. <laughs> I'm sorry. I digress. I, I just, that's well, a pet you know, peeve of it, mine. It's kind of funny because, I'll, you know, what, you, what they do is they replicate the face-to-face -face meeting that they normally have and just have, a, you know, a voice conference. And as we all know, we've all been in voice conferences that, that have been horrible. Mm-hmm. Um, people aren't paying attention. There's yeah. background noise. Anyway, I distracted you. You're doing a report. Yeah, so we're doing this report. We're looking at different work modalities and expectation patterns. And what we're finding is that, you know, a lot of organizations aren't set up to accommodate different work modalities. 
right? So one of the big things which is really interesting is um, switching from project to project. So this is something my students are very much used to. And uh, going from one project to another very quickly, little downtime, being very effective and judicious associated with the amount of hours that they spend, um, those sorts of things, but always keeping um, up to speed on what's happening, lower learning curve, those sorts of things. But when we go to organizations, what we have is very long, drawn out projects um, that uh, get measured after you know a two or three year time period, right? And that doesn't equate at all with how the students expect to work. So I use this term a lot called chunkation, taking large projects and chunkating them to smaller bite-sized projects where mm -hmm. student or teams can switch between one to another mm -hmm. relatively easily. Because if you have a bottleneck, something happens on one project, you got to switch to another, right? There's downtime associated with it if you have nothing to do. And that's the worst thing associated right. with an efficient organization. Right. So chunkation, that's a graduate school term, right? That's my term. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> One day I'll write a book on it, but yeah, I, I, I see all Put these, a hashtag in front of it. Yeah, <laughs> I, I see greater levels. So we had this old wave of trying to create simplicity, and now we have complexity again. Yeah. Right? So we go, go through these cycles of yeah. keep it simple, keep it simple. Oh, wait, wait. We have big data. We have sensor data. We have all this other stuff that's competing. We have you know fragmentation within the market space that's creating greater levels of complexity. So how do we get to a norm where we simplify things over and over again, um, it's tough, right? Because you know we're dealing with a lot of processes, a lot of outdated processes that we're still doing continuously, outdated technology, and we're trying to, you know, uh, make this transition from outdated technology, the you know the client server framework to more sort of cloud based and everything as a service, um, those sorts of things. Complexity keeps rearing its ugly head over and over again, and we almost get to this issue of analysis paralysis. There's so yeah. much to do that we just sort of freeze. Yeah. Okay, so Professor Ari Lightman. Yeah. Here's what I'd like to do as we begin to wrap. What is one thing, Ari, that you would like to give my listeners as a takeaway, perhaps an actionable takeaway, on this experience that you are delivering in the classroom and that you are experiencing yourself with these graduate students? What's one actionable takeaway for my listeners? Sure. Create a safe space where your employees are allowed to do experimentation, right? There's no fear of failure. There's no quantifiable deliverable. It's solely for learning experience, hmm. right? And then have them do a blog post, a readout, something on what they learned associated with the process, mm -hmm. right? Something that's going to help them on, in their day-to-day -day environment. But also, can I do another one as well? I'm sure. only level one. <laughs> focus. What's, what's two things? <laughs> focus on this idea of lateral thinking. Looking at a problem statement from multiple different perspectives. Mm, okay. right? So we do this exercise often called six thinking hats, which is, okay, here's a problem statement, but you look at it with six different lenses. Maybe a project management oriented lens. Okay. Maybe a contrarian, sort of a black hat lens, if you will, maybe sort of a white, so just the information, just the facts. These are important so you can understand, okay, if I ever have to present this idea to compliance, right, I could actually think about and figure out how they're viewing what I'm going to be presenting to them because I've thought through that process. If I go to legal or if I go to marketing, I know what they're going to be thinking about because I've already ran through that thinking right. process. Right, right. Awesome. Brilliant. I love it. So, Ari, where would you like to send people online to connect with you or to learn more about uh, your program at CMU? Yeah, so um, it's, it's kind of funny, Bernie. I go to a lot of conferences and everybody asks me for my business card. I'm like, really? <laughs> a business card? <laughs> Who carries a business card? Um, so, you know, please feel free to Google me. 
Um, don't pay attention to some of the stuff you find. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, but my, the first uh, page that'll come up is my faculty bio, um, my faculty page. So it has my email address right there. I'm a pretty social guy, um, as you know. So if you want to link with me, if you want to tweet with me, if you want to pin me, uh, <laughs> that's all available as well. And are you at Ari Lightman everywhere? Um, I'm at, on Twitter at A Lightman. A Lightman, okay. Yeah, on LinkedIn, Ari Lightman. Okay. Um, and my yeah. listeners know that we'll link that up in the show notes, but if someone's sure. listening who's mobile right now and just wants to find you on their mobile device, just wanted to throw that out there. And my blog is socialtheorem.com. Socialtheorem.com. Yeah. Awesome. Well, Ari, thank you so much for sitting down with me here at Dell World 2015 and having this conversation. I've really enjoyed it. I've learned a lot, and I know my listeners have as well. Thanks, Bernie. Well, I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Professor Ari Lightman from Carnegie Mellon University. Ari is a key contributor to the Social Business Journal issue that we published with Dell, once again titled Digital Transformation, Social Selling Research Insights and Best Practices. This journal is available for download at our website at socialbusinessengine.com. Just visit the journals page or just visit the show notes page for this episode where you'll get a link to it. And remember, this is a one-click open. There's no form to fill, nothing to download. Just open it up right there in your browser. And as I mentioned in the introduction, if you're already subscribed by email to get our weekly podcast updates, which we send every Friday, then you've already received this journal in your inbox. And if you're not subscribed to our weekly updates, I would really encourage you to subscribe so that you don't miss a future episode. Just visit our subscribe page at socialbusinessengine.com. And hey, if you're a regular listener to the Social Business Engine podcast, thank you. I really appreciate some time in your busy day. And if you found this on iTunes, please click the subscribe button so your podcast player is automatically updated each time we publish a new episode, which we usually do on Wednesdays and sometimes on Tuesdays. And please consider writing a review on iTunes for this podcast to help others discover it. Just visit socialbusinessengine.com slash iTunes for a direct link to the podcast. Hey, be sure to engage with us on our social media channels, including LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, Google+, and of course, follow our hashtag SBE show. Well, that's going to do it for this episode. I want to thank my guest again, Professor Ari Lightman from Carnegie Mellon University. This is Bernie Borges of Find and Convert, wishing you continued success on your social business journey. 